You got to have patience with this number one. You don't have patience with this number one, you're done. Fuck the bus. Fuck the job. They drop you off where the one bus stop. Thank God for the number one bus. Wow, I'm talking about the one bus. My friend told me I need to write a book entitled it The Number One Bus Chronicles. not like uh hey how you doing kind of bus it's a more like what's up kind of bus you gotta be pretty tough to ride the one bus there's a whole bus full of different cultures early in the morning going to work on that number one line I started taking the number one bus about five years ago. And I take the number one from Newark to come to Jersey City, to New Jersey City University for me to go to school. It's a mixed bag. Some mornings you got people with attitude. They don't want to let the ladies on the bus first or the kids. A lot of families depend on this bus. When I first moved to Jersey City, I realized I was the only white person on the bus. And frankly, that scared me. The people on the one bus are the grit. There's security guards and janitors and the people that aren't trying to break the law and trying to do the right thing. These people are the muscle. These people make the city move. Kearney is more of the industrial area, and unfortunately, the prison area too. So you're either here for two things work or getting out of prison. <laughs> a lot of ladies come out here to see the people that's across the street from us incarcerated. Going towards Newark, there is absolutely no shelter whatsoever. Taking the bus to Jersey City, there's a shelter that looks like it went through some war. Uh, the one nice thing about it is there is uh, a view of Manhattan from here, and I seem to see the Empire State Building far off in the distance. I should have had more bus service, man. People are here, man. They work hard. You got hardworking people back here putting 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 hours, man. It's not fair. You know? I pay my dollar 60, my feet hurts, jump off the truck. I gotta stand there for an hour, hour and a half for a bus. It sucks, man. There's a whole lot of factories around here. Catching a bus can be a problem because we're really out in the wilderness. Sometimes the bus comes and sometimes it doesn't. I'd like to welcome the film's director, Joel Katz, to our conversation. Joel, thank you so much for even, first of all, creating this film. And what I found to be so interesting and unique about it was that you went in and found a cross-section of our fellow Americans that we often talk about, but we don't hear from. And I'm wondering, what was your inspiration to examine the riders of the number one bus? Okay, well, thank you for having me here, Jenna. Yeah, well, I'm sitting in my office here at New Jersey City University, where I teach. 
in Jersey City. And the bus stop is about a mile away because the film focuses on this one stop. Um, and I know that from commuting to work. I used to take public transportation myself, but for about the last 15 years or so I've driven and I often drive by that bus stop and I've noticed you know, crowds of people waiting in all sorts of conditions, weather, et cetera. And also I, I should mention that our student demographic at NJCU is a very working class population Mm -hmm. similar to those at the bus stop. So I'm kind of in that mix of Jersey City, you know, I'm, I'm more privileged, privileged person, you know, I'm white and I'm middle class, I get to drive to work, but a lot of our students take public transportation. And actually two of the main characters of the film are our former students of ours. So it was really a curiosity, you know, like who are these people standing there at the bus stop? What are their stories? What are their lives like? And as you said, I, I feel also that, you know, we hear about such people, but we don't really get to know them very often. And I think it's very interesting that you also mentioned um, just uh, the change in your own life, which you also sort of uh, get into in the film. And that is that you used to take transportation. And in the film, we sort of touch on the fact that America by and large used to take public transportation, but as, uh, let's say class differences became wider and wider. And of course, uh, urban sprawl or suburban sprawl, really, especially in the case of Jersey, uh, grew. You saw more people getting their own cars and driving and less people and more lower class people relying on public transportation. Was that an intentional thread to come through in the film or was that just happenstance? For me personally, that was happenstance. You know, as I might place of residence changed, you know, I used to live in Brooklyn, so I, public transportation made sense. You know, now I live in New Jersey. So, so personally, that was happenstance. But something else that I discovered through um, the film, really, or, or I knew but became more deeply ingrained in me, is there's public transportation, and there's public transportation, in, in the sense that if you go to a bus stop, say at Exchange Place or a, a locale that serves an economically more privileged class of people, the bus stop isn't going to look the way that bus stop looks like. You know, mm -hmm. I drove by there just a few days ago, and you know, now it's no longer just covered with graffiti, but actually all the window glass has been broken out. And it's been like that for about a year, you know, it, it, it's to me just visually, it's a statement about how our culture and society regards the working poor, who are by and large mostly the people who use that bus stop. And I don't think you'd see conditions like that at a bus stop that serve people who are commuting to Wall Street. I would say that's a fair assessment. Um, I know that New Jersey has uh, done numerous improvements, obviously, to New Jersey Transit. And of course, we've seen light rail systems uh, in Jersey City and also in Newark. And those are beautiful and well-appointed, et cetera. Um, but also what I found was interesting was the riders were talking about not just the condition of the bus stop that they would find themselves waiting at, but the time that a lot of them found themselves waiting. Now, as a former New York commuter myself, I know if I'm waiting for a subway more than 15 minutes, I'm irate. But yet, some of these people were able to stay calm and measured about waits that went over 45 minutes, sometimes an hour and a half. Yeah, I mean, I, I spent many hours standing at that bus stop myself, talking to people and filming, and I, I saw the service schedule was very erratic. It didn't stick to the posted schedules. Although, you know, I should say that the film was not in originally intended to be sort of an expose about public transportation and its inequities. It really was about the personal stories. And that's what most of the film really is about, getting deeply into the lives of the main characters. But circumstantially, you know, part of the reason why I had time to have such long conversations with people at the bus stop and get to know them 
was because they were waiting there 45 minutes. Like I had a captive audience with people until the bus came. And sometimes that would take a long time. Well, I guess part of my interest in bringing up the uh, length of a wait for some of the bus riders is that frequently in the political sphere, we can see conversations when it comes to uh, the working poor and that they're just not working hard enough or they're not trying hard enough, et cetera. And all of the stories, these personal stories that you were able to unearth, I mean, one of the gentlemen was explaining about how he rises at, I think, 3 a.m., to make sure that he can get to the bus stop for six, to make sure that he can get, most people, if they had that kind of commute would just, or let me rephrase that, most middle-class people would not accept that kind of commute that this man was doing as a dock worker. Chris Russell is his name. He commutes from Bushwick, Brooklyn to Kearney, New Jersey every day. He's been doing it for I think 16, 17 years now. Um, He's an ex-military man, so he's tremendously disciplined, but you know, that's what he does. And he, he accepts it as part of his condition. And I agree, middle-class, more privileged people would probably just dismiss that as unacceptable. It's, first of all, all of the narratives that you were able to unearth with all of the uh, different individuals who are highlighted in the film were powerful. Uh, one gentleman I thought also made a really important point and he was talking about, he was a parolee, and you also talk about the fact that a lot of people who are finding themselves coming out of either uh, jail or for coming out of perhaps detention um, on, for immigration reasons can find themselves riding the number one. And the point is, is that he was saying that it's really hard to resist the pull of the streets. Do I work, as I believe he said, 40 hours a week and make $200 or do I go to the streets and make 10 times that? And just in watching that film, hearing that sentence, the choice suddenly became so much clearer that a lot of people are facing. Yeah, that, that choice became very concrete in his life because he really experienced both sides. You know, he was incarcerated for a kind of minor marijuana infraction. He was at Hudson County Correctional, which is around the corner from this bus stop spent a year there, and later in his life, he had the choice um, of work in the streets, as he said, or getting one of these very low-wage sustenance jobs, and he chose the streets. But, you know, Carlos was a very smart guy, and I mean, he, he very self-consciously and strategically analyzed and made that choice. Of course, of course. What is, I guess, the most important takeaway? Because there's literally, this film uh, touches on layers of different social issues, but what is the takeaway that at least you came away with when you stepped back from uh, that editing bay and you knew you were done? What is it that you came away with? You know, empathy and, and understanding of really recognizing that every human story, if you peel through the layers enough becomes really interesting. And also the, the resilience of the characters in the film was just astonishing to me. I mean, I, they, they, like people who, you know, this man who commutes two and a half hours to, to and from work each day, or, you know, people riding the bus to earn a graduate degree after having a really rough upbringing in, in, in you know, inner city Brooklyn. I mean, these people have just such tremendous strength and that really impressed me. Well, I, I honestly can't say enough about the number one Bus Chronicles. It's an incredibly powerful film. And again, what I think is the most touching thing, at least to me personally, was that, again, it tells the narratives, the personal narratives of people that we hear about, um, frequently in the media we talk about in mass, but we don't always get to hear from them as individuals. And so that was really amazing. So Joel, thank you so much for this film. Thank you. And if I can just add, there's a screening hosted by the Newark Public Library on Thursday, October 22nd at 6 p.m. It's a free online event. And I'm in negotiation now with having a broadcast of the film uh, with um, w, uh, NJTV. So look, hopefully that will be forthcoming. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you.